Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with David Svensson, who's going to talk today about hybrid prototyping. David, why do we have hybrid prototyping? Well, what hybrid prototyping brings to the table is that you can uh, start developing your firmware before you have the ready RTL. And one of the problems is that you have a lot of data that you have to move around. What sort of issues do you run into there? Yeah, so that's a big issue. And uh, to solve that, we have enabled a PCI connection directly from the virtual environment to the FPGA. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. David, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so here we're looking at uh, the virtual environment connected over a PCI link to the FPGA. And this will enable us to, uh, to communicate from the virtual environment to the FPGA in the same way as the communication will go on the, between a ship to the other ship when we have them off the tape out. And so what are you actually bringing to the table here by using these two different engines? Yeah, so this uh, virtual environment, uh, here you would have the, the latest, greatest of CPU architecture that currently doesn't exist in RTL. So what you create is uh, transaction logic uh, models that you use to represent the functionality of those IPs. And on those IPs, you then can develop hardware-dependent drivers that will communicate with your other systems. Where are you finding the use for this? Is it, is it in all chips, or is it really at the latest uh, no, process nodes, uh, the most complex chips? Yeah. So virtual prototyping is uh, mainly found uh, in the latest architectures that currently don't exist in RTL. And if you're thinking about, for example, a 5 nanometer chip that's going into a smartphone or even a 7 nanometer chip that's going into a car, all those would require this kind of technology, right? That's true. And uh, we, see, uh, we see that the people are getting more into it as when they realize the benefits of uh, having full visibility and high speed. What did they do before? Before, they uh, simulated a lot and uh, as of today, you can't run those long tests that you need to run to get your hardware bug-free. Basically, what you're doing is adding a lot more horsepower into this uh, entire process, right? Things that you couldn't do before. That's correct. What does PCI Express add to this? So the PCI link adds uh, not only uh, the fast communication, but also that the setup is uh, accurate to what you want to have uh, on your ships, right? So here you see the PCI uh, root complex. It communicates with uh, the VFIO driver on the running on the host system. A VFIO driver is an uh, input-output memory, memory management unit that uh, enables a driver running in the user space to connect directly to a PCI link on the host. And what you provide now is just a massive throughput for a lot of data to move back and forth, right? That is correct, but we also provide you the ability to develop your hardware-dependent driver in a system that looks exactly as your system will look when it's finished. Let's drill down into how you build up the visibility in each one of these. So, for example, in your VDK, which is your model of what will what it will actually look like in the real world. What do you have to add into this? How do you get that to the point where it does reflect what's real? Yeah, so here we have uh, a lot of uh, finished uh, models that you can just drop in, the signware modules or the CPU modules. And once you have them in here, you have the full visibility uh, of the software stack or in the kernel, okay? So here you have full visibility always. On the FPGA side of things, there are a lot of uh, mainstream uh, commercial software debuggers that you can connect to it, but there are also some HAP-specific things you can use to increase your visibility. So in, uh, in this case, I have here added an exector. This one I control over the UMAR bus from a ticker script or a C application. Uh, this uh, gives me the full visibility into all the AXI memory space, so I can read and write any register I want. So let's say I kick off some software application running here that communicates. I can then easily see what registers has been changed from this operation. That is very powerful. 
The other thing that I have on this side are the AXI performance monitors. That's an easy way to find out where the traffic is going. So I can see the number of transactions that happened, the number of bytes. I can also see the latency and which side is waiting for which side. So that gives me an indication of where my bottlenecks are in the design. What I also have on this hub system is the deep trace debug. And that works in the way that during compile, you select your signals of interest. And then at runtime, you can uh, select your trigger event. And once that's happening, uh, this, your signals of interest get offloaded into a DDR memory. And that data you later use to recreate your waveform for you to analyze. In the past, you learned one or the other of these, but you didn't necessarily know both. How has that changed? What, what, what do you have to have as a skill set now that you didn't before? To debug these things, to set up these things, thing, uh, there is actually not much extra skill you would need. To set up a system like this, this is something that is done in, in less than a day. And uh, now you can start add your IPs if you have your RTL here or other modules on this side. Is the goal here to be able to develop a, a system faster, debug it faster, or is it really to develop the software that goes with it? Oh, it's a combination of those things. Everything you can do to shift left, you got to do, right? Considering you are working with both software and hardware, now you have to debug both of them. What happens when you're, you're working with these platforms? Right, so that's obviously very complex. and. On, on the VDK side, you have, as I mentioned, full visibility, but on this side, you can really only debug the software since the hardware is only represented by uh, loosely timed models. On the hardware side, you can debug the hardware and the software together. So for the software, you can connect your software debuggers, either a JTAG or any that comes with the particular CPU you are using. You can also use the exactors to read and write to the registers uh, to see what registers get changed. So those are on the software side. On the hardware side of things, you have deep trace debug, which uh, that during compile, you select your signals of interest. And uh, then at runtime, you set your trigger condition. And when a trigger is fired, uh, this, the, those signals get offloaded into an external DDR memory and that data you'd later use to recreate your waveforms for you to analyze. On top of that, we also have a global state visibility or GSV. GSV uses uh, the readback functionality available on the Silex FPGAs. And it also maps uh, the register value to your RTL name. Uh, GSV can be used on your full design, even if it spans multiple FPGAs or an FPGA of your choice, or even a module of your choice. Now, when we use GSV, we have to control the clock. So, control the clock in combination with this, these live interfaces, you need to make sure that these live interfaces respect the fact that the clock is stopped and don't try to communicate with that part of the design at that time. How does this match up with real silicon? So when you send this out, you've got your GTS2, you've got it all debugged, you think it's all working. By the time you get it back, does it match? Yes, that's the ambition, right? And the good thing is that you can leave in the XI performance monitors. A lot of people do that so they can uh, keep monitoring in the same way as they do on the FPGA in the ASIC. David Svensson, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.